first of all, I have a question of you. Um, how many of you have had breast cancer? Nobody? This is the first audience in five years. How many of you know somebody who's had breast cancer? Okay, take a look around. Look at yourselves. Almost everybody in the room. I chose to limit my talk about cancer and the evidence, as it were, to breast cancer because I want us to get a handle on something that you can walk out of here today with some guidance about. I want you to be able to leave here today with, I can do this about that. And that's my goal for today. I put on here that Dr. Cedric Garland is part of this presentation. He has been my tutor practically since I started. And he has provided quite a number of the slides that I will be using here for you. Um, I want to show you a little bit of the stuff that I've looked up right here, specifically in the UK. Uh, in 2008, there were 48,000 cases of breast cancer. Uh, estimated cost per case in US dollars is $75,000. That's $3 billion, $3.6 billion a year. If we take Dr. Garland's recommendation and his belief in how much we can reduce it, it's 75 to 80 percent. But I am very cautious because we're not going to get to every female person in the population, all right? We're going to get to maybe 20 percent of them who might do something about it. And that would mean somewhere between 9,601 women would not get breast cancer and 38,000 if you push it to the 75 percent with a cost savings of $720 million a year. Now, I am assuming, just like the United States, you have a place to use that money? <laughs> I thought so. One of the other major factors that's happening in many places all over the world is the aging of the population. Right now, you have about 15% of your population over 65. It's anticipated by 2030, you'll have 40%. Guess what that does to the cancer population? Guess what that does to the falls and the elderly? Guess what that does to all the cardiovascular disease and the other things that we've heard today can be impacted by vitamin D? Where's the budget? I don't have it. I wanted to show you this specifically on cancer. This was a talk prepared by a gentleman under the name of Ezekiel Emanuel, who is uh, the chair of a department at the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Since 1960, the average life expectancy has increased almost seven years due to the great advances we have in medicine. The increase specifically from cardiovascular disease changes has been 4.88 years. For cancer treatment changes, 0.19 years. And that's 10 weeks. 10 weeks. I noted that many of you raised your hand with having known or knowing somebody with breast cancer. Has anybody ever lived with anybody that's had breast cancer? Specifically with the treatment for breast cancer during that period of time? Then you haven't picked them up off the floor when they fell down after throwing up for the umpteenth time in the toilet that day because of the chemotherapy. Then you haven't watched them when they came home from the hospital after the radiation treatment bleeding literally bleeding because of the burning of the treatment. All right? You haven't heard the ongoing complaints of somebody who is permanently affected for their entire life, their entire life, after treatment with one of those chemotherapeutic agents with peripheral neuropathy. That means pain. Pain in the hands and the feet, which will not go away. Not only do I possibly have an increase of 10 weeks of life, I have umpteen years of pain. This has got to stop. My motivation for being involved with vitamin D is extremely personal. I will do whatever I possibly can, intellectually, financially, emotionally, any possible way, to help convince you and the populations of the world that you can make a difference in the saving of our lives from the destructive treatments that are given to us in the name of cancer treatment. I want to show you some things that got to me. In 2005, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
For the next two years, I did nothing but read and study breast cancer, and what on earth can you do about it? I have a beautiful son named Keith, who is a biostatistician at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He's actually very famous in his particular area of expertise. And he goes around telling the world what they need to do to do the clinical trials correctly. In other words, paying attention to the data. One little quick side about Keith and our, our, possibly our family. Keith got an award at MD Anderson one time for being an outstanding young scientist. And he was presented with a whole bunch of other young scientists up here with their great achievements. And one of the things that many of them did was they stood up and they said, oh, and I'm thankful for my parents, I'm thankful for my friends, I'm thankful for my whatever. And then they'd go on with their, their reason for being in their, their role. He stood up and said, looking at Leo and me out there, yes, of course, I'm thankful for my parents, but what I'm really thankful for is my data. <laughs> His audience was somewhat like that. I, too, am thankful for the data that is available to all of us to look at. In 2007, two years after I'd had breast cancer, and two years after I spent night and day reading nothing but breast cancer articles and science reports, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. I asked my doctor why. I said, I work out every day. I'm thin. I do all these great things for my body. How could I possibly have osteoporosis? And she said, you probably have a vitamin D deficiency. Well, we tested, and indeed I did. My serum level uh, was less than uh, 20 nanograms per ml, uh, which would be about 50 nanomoles per liter. And that very day, which happened to be February the 13th, 2007, we'll go down in history, in my history anyway, I went back home, started back again on my computer research and stuff and doing with cancer, and then I decided to put in vitamin D in cancer. And up came a study that had been published in February of 2007 by Dr. Cedric Garland of the University of California, San Diego, saying that you could have a 50% lower risk of even having breast cancer if you got your serum level up to 130 nanomoles per liter. I looked at that. My body just kind of did those kind of little loose bumpy quivers that you get. Shortly after that, very shortly after that, literally tears started streaming down my face because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It just was too good to be true. I picked up the phone, I called a friend of mine at UCSD, and I said, who is this guy? Is he a flake? And she says, oh no, he's not a flake. He's been doing this research for, are you ready for this? You already saw it with Bill Brown's slide, 30 years! And he is very discouraged. I said, why on earth is he discouraged? He said, nobody's listening. And today, I have heard Michael Hollick's delightful talk or some versions of it many times, and I said, Michael, it's happening. He says, it's been 30 years. It's time, folks. It's time. And you're here. And you're the ones that can make it happen. At any rate, this, of course, is a particular study, an epidemiological study showing an association there. This is another one done by Lowe et al., also down to the 150 nanomole per liter range, saying that possibly there's an 80% risk reduction. This, another one done by Garland. One of the things I want you to pay attention to is when you're looking at epidemiological studies, or any other study for that matter, is not just consistency like this study and that study and that study, but look at how cleanly that line and those points match. In other words, there's not one point way up here and one point way down here, and I've just drawn a line in the middle, all right? Those are very, very, very close, and it's a very beautiful line. Those are one type of study. This one has been referred to already, done by uh, Paul Delappy study, or Hall, um, um, yes, Robert Haney, out of Creighton University. Vitamin D in cancer. Please especially note here, this was the group they did with about 1,200 postmenopausal women. I have some really big news on this kind of thing that, that fits in my mind as a breast cancer scientist type of person. Number one, 
By the time they were postmenopausal, they were already at a very high risk for having cancer, were they not? If cancer indeed does continue to grow at a very slow pace and it starts to occur more rapidly as you age, then it should have been happening. All right, so but when they entered this study, they did not have breast cancer. Please note the difference between the placebo group, at the bottom of course, calcium all by itself had an effect. This was no surprise. You add vitamin D to it and have a calcium and vitamin D group, and there was a 77% risk reduction. That is phenomenal in terms of percentage. But to me, again, looking at it just mathematically or statistically or whatever, look how strong the slopes of those lines are. They don't wiggle, waggle, go up and go down, and oh, I've just drawn a line in between it. All right? That is a very, very significant downward slope on both the calcium and the vitamin D. The thing that that tells me, folks, is that there's something about the vitamin D connection that causes the cancer to stop in its tracks. Not too surprising. This I especially like as well. This is just a list of all of the cancers that they have in those things. They have the placebo group and then they have the calcium and D group. Please notice at the top where it says placebo, the N was 266 and calcium and D was 403 people. What would be the difference if the placebo group were doubled essentially? On every single cancer that they had, breast cancer, the placebo group, they had seven cases and the calcium and D group, they only had four. Every single one of them had a reduction, and certainly the total down here at the bottom was a total of 18 cancers in the placebo group versus only eight in the calcium and D group. Small numbers, but very statistically significant. The vitamin D, back again to how much and the serum level, our focus within our organization is totally on the serum level and not how much, and I'll tell you more about the why on that in just a minute. The <clears throat> serum level that they got people to in order to prevent these cancers was right at an average of 38 nanograms per milliliter or really close to that 100 nanomoles per liter, not 75. That's where they started. Right. So as a person interested in cancer prevention, the 75 nanomoles per liter is where they started before they gave them vitamin D. Right. So that is very significant. This was another study, um, an observational study, not a randomized trial study, done by Pamela Goodwin out of Mount Sinai University. And again, I get asked all the time, but I've already had cancer. I can't prevent it. Well, let me tell you folks, anybody that's had cancer doesn't want to have it again. There's always a risk of recurrence. <coughs> What she did here was at the very beginning level here, we have the serum level as well as a cancer diagnosis. 12 years later, serum level maps against what's happened in terms of the recurrence, and there was a 50% lower probability of recurrence for those women that had a higher serum level at the beginning. Does that matter? You bet you it matters. You bet you it matters. So if you or your friends have cancer today, it's not too late. It's never too late. I want to show you something about Dr. Garland's approach to the mechanism for cancer. It's not magic, and it's also very, I think I missed this slide here. Um, Dr. Garland's theory about what is the mechanism behind it, he says it's natural selection. It's the engine of the growth of the cancer. It's not something way out there and the thing that comes in and zaps the DNA and says something's wrong here. Our cells, the epithelial cells, and this, this is the type of cancer we're talking about, like breast cancer is an epithelial cell cancer, uh, are held together in my terminology by a kind of a gluey substance. It's called e heron. By holding those cells together, they form properly, they stay, they grow properly, they do all the right things, they actually grow as almost a sheet. When that substance becomes loose in calcium and or vitamin D, it's like a mesh, it tears apart. And the cells go off wandering around on their own. 
And it's that wandering around on their own like root cells that allows them to develop into the cancer cells. I have some slides here that just kind of walk through, oh, excuse me, my here. Um, normally adherent cells are actually sort of square. They're not really round and those little bars in between them are the ECAD heron that hold them together. I don't have enough of it, so I've lost those tight junctions. And the next thing that happens is they start getting more spherical in shape. And we keep doing it. And then they start to grow. Just like anything else put out on its own, that's a lie, it will start to grow and multiply. And there it does. The overgrowth creates the crowding. Finally, it penetrates the basement membrane, which is that substance down there that allows the metastasis of the cancer cells. And then we've got it running through the lymphatic circulation. And there it comes. By putting the ECAD herein back in place, somehow or another, it stops the growth of those. It does not seem to necessarily inhibit what's already there, but it keeps it from growing anymore. The solution is so simple in terms of what we know now, and the what we know now is totally about the serum level, and the serum level is get it to 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. That's it. However you do it, and add the calcium. The calcium is important in this process. I want to show you another how. Part of the thing that we discovered with our process at Grassroots Health to try to help with the vitamin D deficiency cure, stop, palsy, assisted, was we had to have a tool to enable people to do something about it. You've already heard about clinical trials. Clinical trials are very narrow. They have very small groups of people for the most part, and their focus is extremely narrow. We needed a population trial. And so what Grassroots Health has initiated is really a population level intervention project. It's a massive project. The intervention that we have, though, is not truly vitamin D. It's education. We provide education to people in the form of the scientist's call to action that you have in that packet that we gave to you saying, get your serum level here. We provide lectures that are given by the scientists themselves saying, here's what vitamin D is all about. And by the, all, by the way, you can take a vitamin D test and participate in this project and we can accumulate your serum levels and see how you're doing and then obviously track the health outcomes. And what I want to show you today really are some of the outcomes of that study. We now have about 8,000 people enrolled in it from all over the world. We did not have any funding to start with from any major organization whatsoever. It was wide open. It's like, hey, everybody, we need to do this. What are we going to do? And we now have individuals from all over the world that are supporting it on their own. And some of the study results, uh, you have a copy of our first study, which is in your packet. I want to highlight some of the things here. The vitamin D intake per day across the bottom axis there from 0 to 10,000 is what I've shown you on this chart. The serum level nanomoles per liter is on the right of that chart. That bold black line is 40 or <coughs> nanomoles per liter, which is our desired level. That red line is just the average level, the best data there. The biggest single piece of information I can tell you on that right now is who knows what the right intake is. I don't. Take a look at any single intake. Take 4,000 international units. Somebody's at 20, they're taking 4,000 IU. Somebody else is at 300 nanomoles per liter on that same line. At each and every single intake, the dispersion of the results is at least a factor of three from bottom to top. It makes no sense whatsoever to say take this amount without knowing what the serum level is. You've got to know what the serum level is. The other thing that was very significant in the study was to note that the slopes of the line as that line goes across there very significantly. You've got another picture of that in your hand up. As you start out here, that kind of standard rule of thumb about you get about 10 nanograms per, per milliliter for each 1,000 IU is true at the lower doses. But that curve flattens out very significantly. So by the time that you're up to the 150 or so level, and you might want to go up farther, for each 1,000 IU, you might raise the serum level by about one and a half. 
Okay? And that's the millimeter. It does not continue rising at that level. This is a different way of looking at exactly that same chart. How much does the rise go? You get a big rise, like about 12, when your starting serum level is really low. And the farther you get, the less rise in that serum level that you get. Which, come back to another thing here. That's one of the reasons why it is so hard to get toxic with vitamin D. Because after you sort of reach a particular point with the level, it starts to plateau. And it just does not keep going up in a linear fashion at all. This I put also, this you have a table in your chart. I wanted to have a, a handout to take home and stick on the wall and say, let's try this. If you want to know what should be the dosage that I give a patient, that I give myself, given a given serum level from our data, if you start out at 15 animals per liter and you want to get to 125, what dosage should you try? All right, it's still a try. You don't know how your body's going to respond, whether you're going to be at the bottom of one of those things or at the top or somewhere in the middle. But anyway, we did that, and you would start at about 4,000 international units a day and see how your body responds after about three months. Test again, see what happens. But you can see there on, the, on that chart, start at any level, go to wherever you want to be, and you can get some kind of measure of where you ought to be starting with the serum level and hopefully with a little bit less trial and error. These are some of the kinds of things that we are looking at plotting and dealing with as we do our study around the world. This was another major plot that Dr. Baggerly did, my husband, with regards to, we plotted our data, which is the black line, against pre-existing study data out here. The little diamond shape are means of control dosing studies which are done on the left, the square ones, up there were from reported cases of vitamin D intoxication. And to me, the beauty of it is how closely our kind of average line fits all of that existing data, which says what we did was not out of bounds one way or another, but we filled in the gaps all over the place with more than 3,000 unique points. The next steps that we have to do certainly are to further analyze the health outcome in our study expand endorsements to our call to action. In other words, to get people to say, yes, I am going to take action. <coughs> in Canada, there are now two different medical associations, and to the best of my knowledge, these are the first two medical associations in the world to say, I endorse this call to action to get the serum level to 150, 100 to 150 animals per liter, and my membership will take action to make that happen. They will be involved in the next 18 months over some extensive educational programs within their own medical profession to make this happen. We have built a database now structure, not just the data itself, but the structure itself, to be able to handle research projects of all kinds of sizes and shapes and forms of people doing research with vitamin D and human beings. We're not into the mouse research. But our desire with what we have built is to have a centralized kind of database structure where anybody that's doing big research with vitamin D can join that consortium, have access not only to their own data, but that of others, and to expand and rapidly advance the field of vitamin D research. And I thank you. I love this quote here by Richard Feynman, by the way, for the assist. Reality must take precedence, or nature cannot be fooled. Then cancer develops very, very, very slow. The higher they are, the lower it develops. But okay. it is much more. And I looked at your logo, and your logo is better, but you didn't emphasize one thing. Because I saw one lady or one person jumping in the air being very active. Because if you don't move, it's not enough. You cannot just sit, as everybody here in the room right now, on your butt, develop hypoxia, initiating HIF1. 
and then hope that D3 is going to control it. I think you need, there's a lot of messages, but you need to move outside in the sun to get your D3. You need to do sports outside. However you get it, I am very happy for you to have it. I certainly also support the idea of adequate diet and exercise. I work out every day, I eat well every day. I mean, all of those things matter to us, absolutely. Does that hold for children and pregnancy? To the best of my knowledge, it does hold for children and pregnancy. That was exactly the same level that uh, Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner went to with their pregnancy and lactation study, so yes. And it's about to get the serum level. You're not going to give a child that same dosage in order to get to that serum level. The one point that didn't come out when you were talking is I think very important, and you should probably do this, especially in the messages of this area, which is in the mammography screening study. Yes. It's now been clearly shown that uh, uh, increased mammary density is the risk factor for, for breast cancer. It's also been shown that there's a, uh, a, a risk factor for identification of physical deficiency. Indeed. And it changed with seasons. Yes. Showing that they, yes. That, so that using, getting this information out and getting people treated at that stage is right. going to be much more effective than I hope so. Yeah. My question is around calcium. In one of your slides, you mentioned do not forget, uh, forget calcium. I had a 74 year old Lebanese uh, lady with a lot of chronic conditions, and she suffers from osteoporosis, among many other things. And her specialist consultants, endocrinologists, as well as cardiologists, have um, advised her not to take any calcium supplements any further because of the research that came out, particularly in 2010, about the increased risk of cardiovascular events. Um, now she has vitamin D deficiency, or her level was at 50 nanomol per litre, and she did take some oral supplementation that has been advised to take calcium out, though there's still osteoporosis. I wondered if you can comment on that. I think the best I can offer you is second-hand evidence. Um, Michael, would you like to address that? Yep. Yeah, it turns out that the Women's Health Initiative um, that Joanne Manson actually looked at 18 of those, I think, 40 centers, and they did CAT scan it, and they looked at the women taking calcium and vitamin D and did not find any association with increased risk for cardiovascular calcifications. Thank you. Yes, sir. I uh, just as a comment in relation to vitamin D and the uh, and the effect on magnesium absorption in relation to cardiovascular disease because uh, a lot of uh, studies have demonstrated the importance of magnesium in protection against cardiovascular disease and cancer yes. and it would be interesting to have a discussion about that in the discussion period this afternoon. There's also significant numbers of questions and observations and things that are coming out about vitamin K. Uh, as you mentioned, magnesium, and certainly the whole vitamin A issue. So there, again, my focus is on vitamin D. You can't ignore the rest of your life and the rest of those, those uh, micronutrients. They are very important to yeah, You should draw the, uh, the audience's attention to this um, page that you've got there. Right. It, it tells us one very interesting thing, which is if you look at the... Uh, the vitamin D level necessary for prevention of rickets yeah. is much lower than the, disease, the level necessary for prevention of all the other diseases. Yes. In other words, we're at a position with vitamin D now that we were some years ago with vitamin C, that with vitamin C, scurvy is the, the end stage disease, mm -hmm. and prevention of scurvy does not mean prevention of uh, all the other things that will be prevented by vitamin C. That's also with vitamin D. I think that's a key thing. That's why we put that chart in your hand now. It's called our different chart, our disease incidence prevention chart, to show that uh, different diseases take different amounts of vitamin D. It's not a one size fits all in terms of a serum level for thing. But also to highlight the fact that rickets is on the far left of that chart. And yet that's still where most of our public health recommendations are, is with rickets. But thank you for drawing our attention to that. That's why we have it in there. Yes. Yes, I'd like to uh, follow up on the osteoporosis question. Um, we understand that uh, vitamin D is essential, but is there any 
correlation between vitamin K and vitamin K2 and the absorption of calcium for things like osteoporosis. I do not personally know. Does anyone else know that? I guess we better find that out. Michael would like to speak again. Vitamin K2 is really important in basically the generation of the collagen matrix, but I'm not aware of any data that's going to get on calcium transport. Opportunities abound for more research, folks. Thank you. A very yeah, inspiring presentation. Um, I think for most of us, or many of us in this room, maybe with the exception of certain gentlemen, uh, if we went back five years, we probably wouldn't be here because none of us were aware of it Um, so, in a sense, we can see that already we, we, we've come a very long way. If you, uh, if you had a crystal ball, where would we be in five years' time? I mean, what, what should we be doing? What should our uh, authorities be doing? What should the public be doing? What should the media be doing? And the public health professionals. And if you really could look into the future, um, where would we be? I'm a Pollyannish Mary Poppins person, okay? <laughs> What I see, what I truly see right now is in part with our study, we have people all over the world joining. And what we have, due to the internet and the availability of information all over the world, we have a revolution starting. It's, it's on its way. It's happening. Because I get thousands of emails a month saying, I went to my doctor, they refused to give me a test, I'm going to participate in my study and do it myself. So I see an enormous revolution in healthcare happening throughout the world in every single country with individuals starting to take more and more responsibility for their own health. The priesthood of the medical practitioners is going to go away and they will ultimately become informed consultants. And I, yay! all of these doctors and they are coming on board as I mentioned this group in Canada they have been so influenced by what's happened to their patients that it's happened so I think in the five years we it's just cascading it's happening already <coughs> David, David could I ask you to comment on the just a second uh, okay. um, you're doing something similar to what we are and um, Carol is doing but you're doing it in Europe would you like to briefly comment on that? Yeah, well, I'd be very happy to. So uh, our foundation uh, was brought into the uh, vitamin D issue really because of the tuberculosis uh, angle. And uh, one of our board members actually led the Stop TB campaign within the World Health Organization and saw firsthand how uh, vitamin D was deficient in many of the TB population groups. Um, so expanding on that, we looked into the issue and um, uh, very realized that, that you know, there was a revolution happening and uh, particularly our foundation worked with politicians um, and we wanted to ensure that the politicians were aware of this revolution and particularly linking into some of the great work and, and, and uh, Professor Grant's work in particular on the economic analysis that was going on and the cost savings that, that could be made. Um, so uh, we've been uh, very uh, active over the, the, the last 18 months in engaging on a European level in Brussels with parliamentarians uh, in particular to really push the agenda forward. Yeah. And uh, I'm very happy that over that time, uh, groups uh, such as the World Health Organization, the European Commission, um, various uh, governments have all come on board. And um, you know, I'm very uh, happy to uh, continue working on this project. Yeah. We want to be part of the revolution. I want to mention also in the United States, there are two particular states, Alaska, northern, Vermont, northern, which have invited us and we have presented at because they are ready at a state level, at a political level, to take action because they see the enormous health benefits to their populations. Any further questions to Carol? Um, I think um, in this country, we do things obviously differently, and the primary care, care trusts are 
are very much involved in this, and you have had some figures up from leading study. Northwest London is particularly rich in primary care trusts, and we have to look at everything really. Um, some of our studies began so long ago uh, when uh, the idea of babies being born which almost arose out of anecdotes and astrology and all these things. Babies born in the summer, we thought, had a better chance of life than those that were born in midwinter, certainly in the UK. And um, so that was really, we were discovering things that are now being rediscovered because people are interpreting it as light means vitamin D, but that was the only thing. And some of these comparisons have been done. Uh, there was one done, I remember, on cancer of the colon, where milk was considered to be very beneficial. Well, most of the, the uh, people in that study were drinking American cow milk, which um, is fortified with vitamin D. And, and, but it didn't apply to the UK when the milk wasn't fortified. And then during the course of some of these studies, I mean one now, the EPIC study, um, the, amount, the consumption of multivitamins, and doctors are handing these things out to like this, um, no tomorrow, you know, because if they're puzzled about some nutritional deficiency, they think multivitamins will do the job. And now we have a problem with calcium, actually, because in this country, uh, after World War II, the bread, was heavily uh, supplemented, fortified, with calcium, just ordinary chalk. And so what we're worried about now is that we're going to get an excess of calcium. And if we look at veterinary practice, and I won't go into all the reason of that, but we realize there's a risk of calcinosis. And so at the present time, um, uh, and I've got this you know, it's the sort of things that we've worked up with primary care trusts, we have to think about um, the question of the formulations of these things because Jews and Muslims and vegetarians and others get worried and they may not take the fortifications if they're all in supplements if they think it's got gelatin in it or something like that. So we have to look at all these sort of things. And when we come to the question of calcium, we are now trying to drum up some help with the Food Standards Agency uh, so that the calcium content in bread, for example, because we started a campaign for real bread back in the 1970s, we have a great concern about that. So I think one wants to think all the time the holistic side, and there is a danger that suddenly some super vitamin comes up. And it's very important we do give that consideration, but this is, I think, where the primary care trusts have such a responsibility and it's a hot topic in this country, I can tell you, while there's so much controversy over the future of the National Health Service. Thank you. I'd like to just speak as my experience as a layman here. I'm very proud to be here amongst all these eminent people. I'm just an ordinary, everyday person who's been uh, hooked on the work of Professor Hollick and the work of Carol Bangley for some three or four years now since I've discovered them on the internet. And I had to be here today. But my um, experience from our health service, from GPs, dentists, whatever, when I bring up the subject or try and bring the topic to vitamin D, the general response all the time is, oh, you get that from the sun, do you? Yes, you get enough of that in your diet. Where, how can we get this message to the grassroots uh, health practitioners in this country and equip <laughs> I don't know about the timing. I truly don't know about the timing, but I truly also believe it's happening. And we are at a stage with the whole revolution, as it were, of um, the so-called early adopters. That's where it is. I mean, the people that are attending, we have an abundance of what are called alternative medicine or naturopaths and chiropractors and all kinds of people somewhat outside the standard institutional medical care that are saying, I want to try it, it might have some benefit, we're going to do something about it. And those are the ones that are leading the way right now. However, in no way, shape, or form do I want to put down those that are as part of the big medical institutions because they are coming on board too. And to me, I think they are coming on board because of their patient population. Their patients are walking in the door saying, I want this, I need this, do something about it. And they are getting it. 
It's to take an example where I live in North London, in Harrow, there are 44 doctors' surgeries. Um, as I understand it, only two of those are routinely sending many of their patients for testing. And I have to say, they get, they get um, scrutiny from the local primary care trust as to why they're spending the money on tests. But they are getting um, significant results. And, and these doctors would not do it time and time again if they didn't see patients who were getting better very quickly. So the doctors, the doctors talk to each other and it will spread. I'm, I'm afraid it's slow. Any other questions for Carol about um, the cancers? Um, okay. See, it's really up to you. Do you get that message? It's up to you. So I don't think we know one of the health workers managed to see me. And in Ian, what's happened is that year on year, the tests for vitamin D have just doubled, really. Um, I've been working with the Trust Forum since 2002. When I started, nobody wanted to know anything, and it was really, really hard. Um, now, at where I am at this point, because I've seen the um, health benefits, A, we don't have C, we have hardly any seizures at all in uh, neonates. Now they're, they're seeing the cost savings, and that's what they're interested in. It's the cost savings, that's what they're interested in. Not, not so much the health, because they're not going to do it. <laughs> if I could comment on the situation specifically in Ealing, there are examples of Somali girls getting married, having babies, a baby gets ill, um, they arrive in accident and emergency, and they've never seen a general practitioner. They've never registered with a UK doctor. And how to get the message to those girls in those communities is a very, very difficult one. It, it turns out the deputy mayor of Ely is a Somali lady. And the doctors are talking with her about ways to, to, to talk to the community by some of their um, methods of storytelling and, and song and so on, which may sound strange to us, but this is part of the way they communicate. So, these things are happening at the grassroots level. One of the problems is the British National Formulary, which we as doctors refer to when we're looking at what to prescribe. The biggest dose of cholecalciferol available for a GP is 400 international units with calcium. And, and that must be why we have so many people from the UK enrolling in the study, and I know that there are enormous numbers of people in the UK that order their vitamin D supplements on the internet. To, to clarify this, as, as I understand it, um, the 20,000 unit product, a crystal, is listed, but it's listed as a special. Um, There is a 20,000 um, unit product mentioned in the latest BNF. Um, it's a tiny print. It's, uh, it is stated there that it is a special, which means it has to be obtained from particular uh, specialised wholesalers. Um, this is a slightly complicated process, and often GPs are not pushing to supply a special. Sorry. I have got to the colon, um, not um, 
But um, the thing really is that um, it means which doctors go by very much is recommending now that pericalciferol, lurgocalciferol, would be better prescribed without calcium. And that if it was necessary to add calcium, to add that to a separate thing. In other words, they're not very keen now on having blanket multivitamins, which upset the whole uh, idea of personalised or individualised medicine. Good, thank you. I just wanted to say that I work for Penny Dawn Cancer Care, um, uh, for the Bristol Cancer, um, Cancer Support Centre. And we actually use uh, the Bio Care Vitamin D, which is 2,000 international units, and it comes in a small bottle and just very tasty drops. And there's quite a lot of supplement companies which are producing drops, mm -hmm. and the dose is normally 2,000 international units. Um, Nutri is another company, so you know you can obtain it in any health food shop. And the nice thing about drops is that you can take a glass of water and go click, 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 click. You can tell the drop is literally yeah. on your tongue. And, and uh, my brother-in-law takes uh, eight drops a day of, of uh, D3. And yeah. he, he doesn't think anything of it. He wouldn't take eight capsules. Mm -hmm. So the drops are, are certainly in that respect. So it's fantastic for those who don't like tablets. Yes. Can we go back to Jim? <coughs> Experience from uh, the Netherlands, and we use uh, the common cost of all the fluid, FNA, and just 50,000 units per mill. And we ask all the pharmacists uh, do not dose it in drops, but dose it in mills. And a small syringe is delivered, and we use it uh, 50,000 units per mill every fortnight uh, on average. And then it's very easy and very cheap, and it's really worth it. So, I think I would like to add one other thing, not to this conversation right this minute, but for your consideration. Uh, across the world, we really need something better than supplements. I mean, supplements are great. They are marvelous for the UK, probably the US. We have them available or can make them available in the stores on the internet. But the world's population isn't going to end up taking supplements. So back again to Michael Hollick's message about the sun. I think the time is also coming when there's got to be the return to what we can get all over the world and how we do something about it. But I think some really concrete discussion needs to be held amongst the health officials about how are we really going to take care of the world's population, not just those that have access to supplements. But thank you for listening to me on that topic. Thank you, Carol. Yeah.